Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to this afternoon's session of the Washington History Seminar, Historical Perspectives on International and National Affairs. This is the first of many sessions in the fall season. We have lots of programming for you, and we're delighted that you're joining us this afternoon for our exploration of a new book by Fritz Bartel, The Triumph of Broken Promises, The End of the Cold War, and The Rise of Neoliberalism, published just last month by Harvard University Press. Joining us this afternoon as discussants are Aaron Friedberg of Princeton University and Angela Romano of the University of Glasgow. I'm Eric Arneson from the George Washington University, co-chair of the Washington History Seminar, my longtime colleague, collaborator in this project, Christian Osterman of the Wilson Center, is currently in Europe and cannot be here with us today. The Washington History Seminar is a collaborative and nonpartisan venture of the Woodrow Wilson Center's History and Public Policy Program and the American Historical Association's National History Center. And for over the past decade, the seminar has been meeting weekly in the academic year, in pre-COVID times, in person at the Wilson Center, and since the pandemic and, I guess, post-pandemic era here in the virtual realm. Behind the scenes are two people who make these seminars possible, Pete Bierstecker of the Wilson Center uh, and Rachel Wheatley of the American Historical Association. On the logistics front, please note today's session is being recorded and can soon be found on our institution's respective websites. And soon, when we get to the question and answer section of the webinar, we ask those of you with questions to use the raise hand function on Zoom. Um, that is our preferred uh, way of, of uh, uh, hearing from you. That way we can call on you or you can use the Q&A function and pose a question uh, in writing. We'll call on as many folks as we can. Okay, now that I've got that all out of the way, it's time to get our discussion rolling. Our author today is Fritz Bartel, an assistant professor of international affairs at the Bush School of Government and Public Service at Texas A&M University, where he's also a member of the Alberton Center for Grand Strategy. In an earlier incarnation, this book, The Triumph of Broken Promises, won the Oxford University Press USA Dissertation Prize in International History from the Society of Historians of American Foreign Relations. He's co-editor of Before and After the Fall, World Politics and the End of the Cold War, published by Cambridge in 2021, and his research has been published in Enterprise and Society and Diplomatic History. Today, we focus on the new book, The Triumph of Broken Promises, The End of the Cold War, and the Rise of Neoliberalism. Fritz, welcome. The Zoom screen is yours. Thank you very much, Eric, and uh, thank you so much for the, the kind invitation to join you, and, and thank you to Angela and uh, Aaron for uh, agreeing to offer your thoughts on this book. I'm really looking forward to uh, learning from you and, and hearing uh, what you have to say in a couple of minutes. Uh, lastly, thanks to everyone uh, joining virtually uh, on the day when you, you could be watching more clips of the, the Queen's funeral, no less. I appreciate you taking some time in digital space to, uh, to come and uh, learn about this book and, and interact and ask your questions about this book. So I look forward to hearing from you in a few minutes uh, as well. Um, given the time that we have today, I, I thought I would keep my remarks at a fairly high level and try to lay out the origins of the book, uh, its arguments and some of its implications for the study of the past and the future of international politics. Uh, this book really began for me with what was an unexpected and unknown fact. Uh, when, I, when the Berlin Wall came down, the Eastern Bloc was over $90 billion in debt. Uh, something on the order of $210 billion in today's terms. Uh, $90 billion in debt to Western banks uh, and uh, capitalist banks and Western governments. When I first learned of this fact, uh, it didn't really make sense to me. Uh, it, didn't, it didn't make sense why capitalists would lend to communists, and it didn't make sense why communists would borrow from capitalists. Uh, this didn't seem to be kind of conform to the narrative of the, at least the Cold War that I had uh, come to know. And the more I looked into it, the more a couple of things became clear to me. Uh, first, we didn't yet have a history of this debt uh, in any great detail, at least, uh, where it came from, uh, why it developed, what its ultimate consequences were. Uh, the history, uh, second, the history of this debt uh, and the history of debt and oil were intimately intertwined. And in many ways, the origins of the debt went back to the oil crisis of 1973, which is where uh, my book really uh, takes off in, in its early chapters. Uh, third, it became clear to me that when you looked at the world through finance and oil, 
the two kind of uh, main vectors that I, I look at the world. Then it, it was clear to me at least that the histories of democratic capitalism and state socialism uh, really were a shared history or could be told as a shared history and thus could be compared and were ultimately comparable. They could be uh, part of a, a comparative history, which is ultimately what uh, this book uh, aims to achieve. And finally, uh, the history of debt and energy, uh, I also realized were intimately tied to moments of profound political and ideological change in the late 20th century. Uh, most particularly in my case, uh, what we now call the end of the Cold War and the rise of uh, neoliberalism. And they were tied uh, to these profound moments of change through another important economic phenomenon of the late 20th century, uh, which I broadly call economic discipline in the book in which I'll say a little bit more about in a few minutes. So using the history of finance, energy and economic discipline, the book aims to shed light on some of the enduring questions in the history of the late 20th century. Uh, first, and perhaps most obviously, why did the Cold War end? Uh, it's a question that, that has preoccupied scholars since the Cold War came to an end. And hopefully this book offers uh, some uh, new contributions to, to answering that question. Second, why did it end relatively peacefully? Uh, of course, uh, it not ending peacefully is why so many people uh, believed that it couldn't happen. That was how they envisioned, uh, the only way they envisioned that it could end is, is in a kind of violent confrontation. And so the fact that it did end relatively peacefully presents a kind of puzzle for us to explain as historians. Uh, third, what role did key actors in our traditional understanding of the end of the Cold War? Mikhail Gorbachev, of course, we all uh, heard about again just a couple of weeks ago with his passing. Uh, Western actors, broadly speaking, so people like Ronald Reagan and, and George H.W. Bush, but also many actors in, in Western Europe, and in my case, uh, capitalist banks, bankers, uh, what role did they have? Finally, what role did so-called people power in the streets, uh, the, the kind of movement of popular resistance against communist governments in, in the Eastern Bloc, what role did they have in ending the Cold War? The scholars have long debated all of these actors uh, and, and ironically or unexpectedly as, as I found it in this book, uh, these rather impersonal structural forces of finance and energy and economic discipline could shed new light on how these actors, uh, what influence they had on the course of history uh, as the Cold War came to an end. Uh, finally, the, the last question that I actually didn't set out to, uh, I didn't think I'd be commenting on in this book, but became clear they, they were intimately tied together. What connection between the end of the Cold War and the rise of neoliberal governance around the world, what connection was there between these two uh, really important uh, global phenomena in the late 20th century? So scholars have produced, uh, of course, many decades of insightful and groundbreaking scholarship on both of these large topics, the end of the Cold War and the rise of neoliberalism. Uh, but they haven't yet, I, I believe, uh, seen them as products of a shared history, and specifically a shared history of the global economy uh, in the late 20th century. Uh, the book aims to tell that shared history using newly available archival evidence from many archives on both sides of the Iron Curtain, and by offering a new definition of what the Cold War was and why it ultimately came to an end. And that new definition of the Cold War starts from the premise that the Cold War's end was fundamentally different from its beginning. And it posits that the Cold War began as a race between democratic capitalist and state socialist governments to expand the social contracts that prevailed in their societies as both sides raced to promise their people a better life and deliver on that promise. But because of the economic crises of the 1970s, beginning with the breakdown of the Bretton Woods system and the oil crisis of 1973, the Cold War, I argue in the book, ended as a competition to discipline social contracts. Global capital and energy markets exploded in size and importance in the late 19, uh, excuse me, in the 1970s, just as both common, uh, the communist world and the capitalist world entered a crisis of stagnation after a period of explosive uh, economic growth from 1945 until the early 1970s. This meant that as long as states maintained access to either capital markets or energy resources, they could continue what I call the politics of making promises at home and fight the Cold War abroad. Guns and butter, in short, in the 1970s became dependent on finance and energy. If, however, they ever lost access to finance, uh, financial or energy wealth, as almost all states did at some point in the 1970s or 1980s, then they would have to turn to what I call the politics of breaking promises and impose economic discipline 
at home. Economic discipline came in many forms, uh, shutting down unprofitable uh, state enterprises or companies, uh, laying off redundant workers, imposing monetary and fiscal austerity, often at the, at the behest of international organizations, and liberalizing trade and capital flows uh, across borders. After 1973, this struggle to impose economic discipline became the terrain on which democratic capitalism and state socialism waged their contest. And the stakes, as, I, as far as I see it, were nothing short of existential. Governments that could ex successfully impose this economic discipline without producing a destabilizing social backlash would survive, and those that could not would collapse. In sum then, the book argues that the Cold War began as a race to make promises, but it ended as a race to break promises. Democratic capitalism prevailed in the Cold War because it proved capable of breaking promises and imposing economic discipline. And communism collapsed because it could not. Neoliberalism rose as the Cold War waned because its pro-markets uh, anti-statist rhetoric provided governments with an ideological framework for imposing this politics of breaking promises. It, in short, made a virtue out of economic discipline. Electoral democracy and neoliberal ideology gave Western states the political and ideological tools that they needed to meet the challenge of breaking promises. And lacking these tools, the communist states of the Eastern Bloc democratized their political system and reformed their ideology in the 1980s as a means of imposing economic discipline. And it's this process of political and ideological reform that we now call the collapse of communism and the end of the Cold War. So this is an argument that I explore over 10 chapters in the book uh, that span the global North. I go from uh, discussing things as varied as Thatcherism, Reaganomics in the United States and the UK, uh, to perestroika in the Soviet Union, to the revolutions of 1989. In the first half of the book, I trace how global capital markets and energy wealth emerged in the wake of the 1973-74 oil crisis and how they slowly gave rise to the challenge of economic discipline in both East and West. This challenge was one that the West confronted by turning to neoliberalism, which I define as a in the book as a political ideology that uses markets to increase the free flow of goods and capital across state borders. Importantly, increase inequality within nation states, and finally decrease the state's role in providing social and economic security for its citizens. As many scholars have stressed, one of the primary ways that neoliberalism works in societies is by depoliticizing the economy and by making, or appearing to make at least, social and economic outcomes the work of so-called market forces rather than government actions. In the book, I quote a Federal Reserve official who called this basically the look no hands doctrine. By making social and economic outcomes like the severe a recession that followed Paul Volcker's shock to US dollar interest rates, by appearing to make that look like the work of market forces, government officials could often escape political culpability for uh, the imposition of economic discipline. No such recourse, of course, was available to state socialist governments. By the very design of their systems, their hands were in every aspect of their society, and thus they were responsible for all economic and social outcomes within their borders right down to the price of bread over which the Polish crisis uh, and the rise of solidarity in the early 1980s uh, broke out. In part two of the book, I turn to what we normally think of as the end of the Cold War and analyze the launch of Perestroika and Glasnost in the Soviet Union, Gorbachev and Reagan's superpower diplomacy, the repeal of the Brezhnev Doctrine, the revolutions of 1989, the fall of the Berlin Wall, and the rapid reunification of Germany. From these histories, I think a number of important implications and conclusions emerge. And so I'll just take a few moments uh, to spell those out before I turn the floor back over to Angela and Aaron to hear their thoughts. First, it seems to me that the revolutions of 1989, particularly those in Poland and Hungary, which were the ones that kind of set the ball rolling in that pivotal year, uh, the revolutions of 1989 were primarily debt crises in which Eastern Bloc governments liberalized their political systems as a means of gaining their society's acceptance of austerity. Uh, this austerity was uh, uh, kind of imposed from uh, outside by organizations like the IMF, and it, it stemmed from this sovereign debt 
that $90 billion figure that I quoted at the beginning, uh, as they had to address their problems uh, relating to the, to the debt, they, they had to turn to their domestic populations and try to figure out a way to uh, get their, their people to accept austerity and political liberalization turned out to be uh, the means that they used. Uh, second, in, in contrast to many uh, scholars at the end of the Cold War who have said that Western actors really played relatively little role in ending the Cold War, uh, I, I see a rather significant role uh, for Western actors in uh, spurring what we think of as the end of the Cold War. Primarily, this happened through organizations like the IMF, which pressured governments uh, around the world, of course, to impose austerity, but including those within the Eastern Bloc. Uh, third, and it's a slightly uh, awkward argument to make a couple of weeks after his passing, but in many ways, Gorbachev, uh, Mikhail Gorbachev was not, uh, was not unique. Uh, he was instead uh, kind of reflective of long-term, uh, long-building forces within the, the Soviet Union that were slowly changing how the Soviet Union, how the Kremlin understood its national interest. Uh, and as, as he put those policies into effect in the late 1980s, of course, it had uh, dramatic change on the course of the Cold War. To me, that's ultimately a good thing, that he is, uh, in some ways, that the case can be made that he's uh, ultimately not the uh, supremely unique figure that we often think of him as. Uh, and that goes to the, the point that uh, as we think about great power competition and we think about the end of the Cold War and why it came to an end, the more our explanations rely on the presence of a truly unique figure like Gorbachev, the less confidence we should have that great power competitions will ultimately turn out peacefully. So if we can find and build a case, which I hope I've done in the book, uh, for why uh, cold wars or great power competitions in the nuclear era can turn out on peaceful terms, uh, then to me, that's ultimately a, a good thing and a hopeful sign. Uh, next, uh, I make the case in the book that the Reagan military buildup was in fact decisive. And it was decisive primarily because it was funded by a deluge of foreign capital that flowed into the United States after the Volcker shock of the uh, late 1970s and early 1980s. The Volcker shock in turn was, as I describe in the book, the key act in my mind uh, for the renewal of the structural power of the United States in the international system in the post-war period. Uh, Volcker's willingness to impose unprecedented economic discipline on the American people showed various forms of foreign capital holders, uh, capital holders around the world, uh, that their money was ultimately safe in, in American hands. And uh, they rewarded the United States with this deluge of foreign capital, uh, which continues to this day to support uh, what I ultimately conclude is a US empire uh, that is funded by uh, overseas capital. Uh, next, it seems also clear to me that people power was indeed decisive. So the, so the, uh, the people in the streets of the Eastern Bloc who were protesting their governments played a, a, a very decisive role in uh, bringing the, their, their own governments to an end and bringing the Cold War to an end. I think that rests uneasily with a conclu another conclusion that I draw in the book, which is that the seat of government power was ultimately returned to the people only so that their power to resist the government could be transcended. The end of the Cold War, I conclude, was a moment in which the, people, the people's power peaked and the moment in which it was ultimately overcome, in which their resistance to the forces of economic discipline were ultimately overcome. Uh, finally, and I'll, I'll, I'll conclude here, uh, I think the, the history I present in the book suggests that future great power competition is just as likely to be decided by how states respond to and manage their relationships with their own populations, as it is to be decided by how they manage their relationships with each other. So the, the Cold War in my telling uh, was ultimately decided by how governments responded to and were able to maintain the le legitimacy in the eyes of their own population and rather less to do with how they managed uh, their international relationship between uh, each other. And I think that has uh, important implications for how we think, of course, about the United States relationship with China today uh, and how we think about the future of great power competition uh, in the nuclear era. So with that, I'll turn it back over to uh, Eric and I look forward to your thoughts.
Ritz, thank you very much. I think we have a lot to discuss today. Uh, our first of two commentators uh, is Aaron Friedberg, a professor of politics and international affairs at Princeton University, where he co-directs the Center for International Security Studies. He received his AB and PhD degrees in government from Harvard University, and he's the author of a number of books and articles, including most recently, Getting China Wrong, published by Polity in 2022, and an article, The Growing Rivalry Between America and China and the Future of Globalization in the Texas National Security Review, Winter 2021-22. Aaron, screen's yours. Eric, thank you very much. Um, I want to start by uh, expressing my appreciation for, for this book. So I'm, I take a couple minutes just to do that because I think it's important to highlight what in my view, makes this such an excellent piece of work. Uh, first, and obviously, and this was clear from Fritz's comments, if you haven't read the book, I strongly recommend it, uh, it addresses big and important questions. So why did the Cold War end, when and how it did? Uh, what accounts for at least the partial initial convergence of the political economies of Eastern and Western uh, nations after the end of the Cold War? Uh, the book offers a framework for thinking about these questions, one that emphasizes factors that, as Fritz suggests, and this is certainly my, my reading as well, perhaps haven't gotten the attention that they deserve, the role of energy, uh, and in particular, the role of, of capital markets. And it weaves them together in a coherent and compelling way. Uh, the book is full of novel insights uh, and challenges to conventional wisdom. And it moves easily from the kind of macro level structural uh, to the micro and back, showing how these large kind of world historical forces manifested themselves in the thoughts and actions of, of individuals. It's based on a rich and deep historical research, uh, the archives of uh, several governments, international organizations, memoirs, multiple languages, Polish, Russian, German. I'm sure I've left others out, uh, but you don't see that every day. And last but not least, uh, it is clearly and engagingly written. Uh, so I, I just want to say I wish that there were more political scientists doing this kind of work uh, and more historians, too, for that matter. So now uh, some questions. First, uh, regarding this, the parallelism uh, that, that Fritz draws between East and West. Uh, the book argues that both blocks made promises of increasing material well-being uh, and due in part to the effects of energy shocks, both had to break them, and that that led to a convergence in their political economies towards something that uh, Fritz describes as neoliberalism. But a number of questions. First, were these promises really the same? Uh, the West, Western governments uh, promised material well-being, but they almost they also promised political liberty. And Eastern governments justified the lack of freedom that they granted to their citizens as a necessary part, supposedly, of a system that generated increased welfare. So it seems like those promises were quite different. And as the book notes, this difference, in fact, helps account for the resilience of liberal democracies in the face of crises and ultimately for the brittleness of communist regimes. These crises uh, may have been triggered by the same events, but were the challenges that both sides faced in the 1970s and 1980s really of similar magnitude and character? Even before the first oil crisis, uh, as Fritz notes uh, in, in passing, the Eastern Bloc regimes were beginning to run up against the limitations of their state-directed economic systems. There were deep problems with those systems. They were inefficient. They were wasteful. Uh, they lacked incentives for enterprises and for individuals. Uh, they were increasingly, and this is, of course, especially true of the Soviet Union, uh, weighed down by the burdens of massive uh, security apparatus, both for domestic security and for projecting power overseas, in the Soviet case, also the burdens of empire. Uh, and they were encountering notable different, uh, difficulties in achieving and sustaining innovation, particularly innovation in the commercial, uh, what were becoming the commercial spheres in uh, the West of IT technology, computers, and so on. So they had deep underlying problems. To varying degrees, by contrast, Western societies uh, may have been encountering uh, 
the limits of the generous social welfare programs that they had created, uh, problems that arose from uh, the power of certain unions and excessive regulation. And it's clear in, in Fritz's accounting that there are differences. I mean, he talks primarily about the US, the UK, and somewhat less about France, but each of those cases is different. And obviously the United States is closer to one end of the spectrum. Uh, I don't know whether France or UK is further at the other end uh, by the time you get to the 70s or 80s. But um, these problems were arguably accretions or impediments that reduced the ability of the underlying market mechanisms uh, on which these systems rested to generate growth rather than with the fundamentals of capitalism. So whereas I think the challenges had to do with the fundamental character of the systems in the East, in the West, it doesn't seem to me that that's so. Again, it's it, these were not trivial problems, but they were not fundamental in the same way. And last on this comparison, I think it's fair to ask whether the responses really were comparable. And Fritz describes them in, in comparable language uh, and some of the, the really most stimulating, interesting comparisons. Uh, the idea of Margaret Thatcher undertaking perestroika is, is uh, striking. Um, but there were differences, and I think they were really profound. In the West, it seems to me that what we observe is an adjustment in the relations between state and market, not the abolition of the welfare state or the total deregulation of markets. And again, in each of these Western societies, that blend of state and market was somewhat different, but the response was to adjust it, uh, not to overthrow it. And by contrast, in the East, uh, what we see is a transformation in the nature of the relations between uh, uh, state and market with a drastic reduction, at least initially, in the power of the state relative to markets. So I think what we see in the East is a change in kind, not just in degree, whereas what we see in the West is a change in degree. Regarding uh, Fritz's account of the complex events leading to the end of the Cold War, I found this plausible and illuminating uh, especially regarding the role of debt and the vulnerability uh, to pressures for reform that indebtedness created. And there are a couple of sort of poignant quotes from communist officials who realize that they've uh, they've eaten the cheese and the trap is about to close on them. Uh, and also some who were wary of it initially, and of course turned out to be right, that getting into debt created vulnerabilities that could be exploited. So a couple of questions about this part of the book. Um, I think more attention, uh, as difficult as it may be to measure, more attention deserves to be paid to the role of what, for lack of a better term, I would call demoralization and exhaustion on the part of uh, nations of the East, uh, and true both of leaders and of people, that leaders had to varying degrees lost faith in the superiority of their system as a result of this now several decades of accumulating poor performance. and populations also uh, were motivated by a mix of material and immaterial forces. Uh, it wasn't just that they were being asked to sacrifice. Um, they were aware increasingly, and again, it varies by by country. It probably was most the case in, the, in East Germany. Maybe it was somewhat less so in other places, but an awareness that people in the West were enjoying a better way of life uh, and that that was something that People wanted to, they wanted to have color television and cars that worked and so on. Uh, there's also frustration with repression that eventually comes to the fore. And it's not just about uh, economic repression. I think it's about political repression. And in the Soviet case in particular, there's nationalism lurking beneath the surface that then pops up. Uh, a related point. Um, did the leaders of the Eastern Bloc countries and the Soviet Union really willingly give up power? And Fritz uses that word. Um, but the accounts that he gives of events in Poland and Hungary and East Germany and the Soviet Union, at least as I read them, all show Leninist party leaders struggling until the last moment to hold on to power. People who believed that the the, their most important goal really was to sustain the power of the vanguard party. And 
my reading of this, and it, it was different in different cases, but they're trying to jury rig mechanisms that would uh, allow them to increase their legitimacy by appearing to allow political representation and even maybe edging up the competition without actually doing so. Uh, wouldn't it be more accurate to say that they set in motion processes over which they eventually lost control and they were swept away by them rather than sort of willingly stepping aside? A couple of final questions. To what extent um, is it accurate to say that the Cold War really was privatized in its in its latter stages? And this is another arresting uh, turn of phrase that Fritz introduces, really very thought provoking. Um, it would seem that first Western governments permitted and encouraged lending to Eastern Bloc countries in the initial stages in the 70s. They could conceivably have done things to try to discourage it or prevent it. And at various times they, they did. Uh, and then in the crucial second phase of the story in the 1980s, um, governments used their influence, both direct and in international institutions like the IMF, to bring pressure for reform to bear. So it wasn't just sort of capital bankers pulling their money out. It was also shrewd uh, strategic actors, both in, in Germany, in the United States, taking advantage of this leverage to try to achieve strategic objectives. At least in theory, uh, there was another way of stimulating growth without necessarily imposing harsh discipline on workers. Uh, and that was to pursue technological innovation in order to increase productivity. Um, did the Eastern Bloc leaders see this as an alternative? There's some suggestion that they did, and they were trying to get hold of technology from the West, presumably to copy it and be able to use it themselves. Uh, but then the question arises, why weren't they able to, to do it effectively? And I think that gets back to the fundamental weaknesses of communist systems. Let me ask a, a, a uh, offer a closing thought, and Fritz touched on China, and that's very much where my mind has been uh, in, in recent years. And this comparison to China is really interesting uh, because the CCP, at least up to this point, has engineered its own mix of state and market that has been successful uh, thus far, at least, in generating growth without relaxing the party's grip. So they seem to have found the solution to this problem, at least temporarily, where their Eastern uh, uh, Bloc contemporaries couldn't. And I suppose the question then becomes, could the Soviet Union, could the Eastern Bloc countries in some way have done the same, or were they already too far gone uh, by the time this, these crises hit them uh, to make that change in direction? So again, I, I love the book, couldn't recommend it more strongly, uh, and was a pleasure to read it. Aaron, thanks very much. Fritz, do you want to take a moment to reflect or respond to some of what was just raised? We uh, do, now we can certainly, do that I, Maybe, otherwise I, I may not stand a chance of uh, addressing uh, all these wonderful questions. I, I probably won't get to all of them anyway, but um, I'd, I'd love to, to say a few words about these. Um, I don't think that... To your, I'll try to just go in order. That seems like maybe the best way to do it. Um, I don't think the promises were were the same. I try in a. It's it's very brief in the introduction to lay out that they are in fact um, of a kind of different type uh, from each other. But I, I also want to group them under this general idea of the politics of making promises. And and as you say, I think the idea that political liberty. Uh, or and political legitimacy uh, is is respected or is, is maintained through elections uh, in the West. Ultimately, it proves its importance at the moments of breaking promises that come in the 70s and 80s, and not at an earlier period. So, uh, I also say earlier in the in in the introduction um, that I think that the East ultimately made more promises to their people and therefore had just a greater kind of the challenge once make once breaking promises emerged was of a much greater uh, magnitude than it was in the West. If you don't maintain a strong state market distinction, um, then it becomes much more difficult to do the kind of uh, uh, you know, 
no hands doctrine that uh, the neoliberals turned to by the 1970s and 1980s. So uh, the, the the different nature of the promises I think was built in from the start and, and ultimately proved decisive. Um, of course, the the book you know still maintains that there is this kind of unifying aspect to them that uh, both sides are competing by making promises to their people, even if the promises themselves uh, are slightly different. Um, the challenges in the East, no doubt, were of a greater ma magnitude. I think uh, I think that's that's definitely true. Um, one of the things I tried to uh, bring to the fore, though, was the idea that uh, it seems to me I wasn't there, but in the 1970s, it was it was equally conceivable that the problems of uh, beset, kind of besetting democratic capitalism, um, perhaps not so much in terms of growth. But certainly, in terms of governability, um, were equally, if not more, not uh, more severe than those in the East. So, uh, if growth ultimately wasn't the the name of the game, the only name of the game, but distribution and and legitimate uh, distribution was what was really important, or planning your way through. Uh, economic crises was what was ultimately important, which in the 1970s, as I, I opened chapter one with uh, two, so, two communist officials driving through Moscow, talking, bragging about uh, their planning ability, which the West doesn't have. Uh, you know, just a decade later, that ability to plan looks like a, a weakness rather than a strength. And so, um, so in, in trying not to kind of impose our retrospective view uh, although I ultimately think it's true that the scale of the challenges were greater uh, in the East than the West. I, I, I wanted to bring out this idea that uh, in the 70s, at least, it seems you know, radically open as to which system is ultimately the one of the future, which system will, will uh, emerge as uh, the one that, that people would want to uh, live under. Um, are the responses the same? What are the, what are the differences? Uh, again, I think, I guess the, the the framework of the book is that all of these systems from the United States uh, all the way to the Soviet Union on the other end are on a kind of continuum of state market relations. And so the idea that there were changes in kind in the West, but changes in, uh, or excuse me, changes in degree in the West and changes in kind in the East, uh, I think that that makes a great deal of sense. Um, but that that would also reflect a kind of if you if you have a state that is much much more dominant over any kind of market forces, then you would be looking at a basically a change in kind by the time you get to the 1980s if you're in the Soviet Union. Um, but one of the things that that seems apparent to me uh, is that we can think about Perestroika's uh, economic reforms as trying to expand the scope of market relations, of course, in the Soviet Union um, at the expense of the control of the state. And you know, to put that on a continuum with what Thatcher or Reagan are doing in the United States or the UK is a kind of historical, a move of historical analysis. Of course, it's not there in the documents per se, but um, I, I guess for the for the book to to work and for it to for its message to land uh, and to be, if it is deemed uh, ultimately to 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 seem like it holds a grain of truth, then then those two things ultimately are comparable, uh, and and across the board, across East and West, governments in the 1980s are moving more towards market relations rather than uh, state-centered uh, forms of organizing their economy. Um, the question of demoralization, absolutely, I, I think it's also uh, very much there. I. There's uh, was fascinating to see this quote from some Soviet official that the people ultimately want the delicacies of the West and the uh, oil and uh, grain of, of the East. And that's, they, that's kind of, that would be the perfect world. Uh, but of course they didn't get to choose uh, between those two. They, they had to choose one or the other. Um, I think that demoralization becomes clear, it becomes important uh, precisely at, again, at the moments where governments feel they are in the position where they have to force or ask their people to make some sort of sacrifice. And um, democratic governments, Western governments, uh, I ultimately conclude because of the legitimacy that electoral democracy grants them, uh, 
are able to ask their people for sacrifices that Eastern governments are not. So that, so that demoralization seems to me to be there and slowly building for a long, long time. And the question becomes, at what moments is it decisive? And it's those moments when the governments feel that they have to ask their people for uh, some sort of sacrifice, which they're not willing, that they're not willing to give. Um, you absolutely right. They didn't give up power willingly. I mean, uh, they, you know, you could we can you could complicate that to a much greater degree. I think they are holding on to power until the very very end. Uh, and the question the question then becomes, you know, why still if they're not um, just stealing from the state, which would be another way of explaining the end of the Cold War, that all of these communists eventually give up on their ideology and realize they can become rich capitalists. If they're actually trying to hold on, why do they still at some point actually give up the power, right? And in the Hungarian case is the most clear to me here where they they can tell themselves, they can see that the economy is gonna enter a period of two or three years of deep recession. And they'll be able to, they think, come back into power at some point in the mid 1990s under a new kind of party banner. Uh, and retain political power within the country. And of course, that's roughly what uh, actually happened. So so I think ultimately, these are all very self-interested in calculating and strategic actors. Uh, and I was trying to figure out, even under those circumstances, why uh, actors like that would ultimately give up power. And I think it just has something to do with this, this politics of breaking promises. Um, you, the last couple of questions, you're absolutely right about the privatization of the Cold War. It seems to me that's Kind of reflective of all cases of privatization, right? There's nothing natural about them ever. They, the state could always take them back over or play a greater role. Um, and and this and I think something about Cold War diplomacy, something about détente, the state or states, the Western states were were actively letting their private actors do much more of the uh, the diplomacy or the the interaction with their counterparts in the East, and so. Um, I, I think the state and private dynamic is important. The one reason I did want to, to really frame it in privatized terms though, is I don't think, uh, although the state actors had power over, uh, kind of technically they could have retained power over their financial uh, private market actors, at many points they don't, it seems to me, they just don't know the extent of what's going on. They don't know the extent of the activity. So. Uh, for instance, uh, there's a major financial crisis in the Eastern Bloc in 1982 that Reagan administration officials don't seem to be fully aware of the scale of, even as they're trying to impose these dramatic sanctions on the Eastern Bloc. So that so there's this enormous crisis unfolding that if they were aware of it, it would be like, hey, this is unfolding exactly as we want it to, but they don't quite seem to actually grasp uh, what's going on. So I think the private actors are, are ultimately important. Um, Technological innovation, they, they, they make this attempt many, many times uh, to try to import it. Um, I, I ultimately conclude that access to technology and capital is not what does them in. That, that would be a counter argument to, to some of what I've put forward. It's really uh, how do they use it or, or really misuse it uh, that ultimately uh, does them in. And so um, on the question of China, I think uh, it's one that, that uh, would really, you know, it's something that isn't really fully addressed in the book. You're right, and the people who have looked at it closely have concluded that, this, at least in the Soviet case, it wasn't really possible because the military-industrial complex was so much larger in the Soviet Union uh, that simply kind of trying to open up the country to the market uh, in a in a Chinese type of fashion would, would just not have worked. I think there's also important differences in level of industrialization. Uh, and so if you think about one of the challenges of breaking promises is really how do you uh, move from a post a de a, an industrial world into a, a post-industrial world, I don't think that that challenge is quite the same in China as it is uh, for the nation states of, this, of the Eastern Bloc or the Western Bloc. So um, hopefully that didn't go on too long. And uh, thank you very much for, for those great questions. And thank you. Uh, just a uh, note to those who are tuning in. Uh, once again, you can use the raise hand function if you want to pose the question directly yourself. We'll call on you. You have to unmute yourself, or you can use the Q and A function 
on Zoom, uh, and a number of you have already started. So feel free to get in the queue now. Our second discussant this afternoon is Angela Romano, who is lecturer at the School of Social and Political Sciences at the University of Glasgow. She was previously at the European University Institute and was the Marie Sklodowska Curie Fellow at the London School of Economics. An international historian of the 20th century, her main research interests include the Cold War, regional integration and cooperation processes, and international economic relations. She's published extensively on these subjects and is currently finalizing her second monograph, The European Community and Eastern Europe in the Long 1970s, Challenging the Cold War Order in Europe, that will be published by Rutledge. Amongst her latest publications is a co-edited volume, Engaging with the West, Socialism's Fateful Strategy in the Long 1970s, published by Rutledge in 2020. Angela, welcome. Thank you, Eric, and thank you for having me here. It's a great pleasure to discuss Pritt's book. Um, precisely the, the edited volume, the project that led to the edited volume is where we came to know Fritz in person as we invited him uh, to present his research. So it's, I'm delighted to see the book out. Also to see many of our uh, team uh, members acknowledge in the um, in the acknowledgement let's say, of the book. Uh, then, so I, I greatly enjoyed the book. Um, uh, no, no, no compromises there or no doubts there. Um, I think it's very, very much readable and and easy to digest. And we were saying with Eric, this is definitely going. I, I wish you so, but in my opinion, this is definitely going to enter many reading lists because. I'm coming to the point. There are books that are monographs that are very meticulously um, uh, providing the research and in terms of a lot of archival documents, a lot of engagement with the existing historiography, very meticulously so. There are books that do so, but also have the ambition of providing a new interpretative framework um, or a paradigm. But usually those are very massive and difficult to digest. Many pretend to have read those books, few have, and they don't get into reading list. And then there are books who are very much concerned with providing a new interpretation, a new paradigm. And so they move nimbly, as, as Aaron was pointing out, across micro and macro, and they would uh, select very craftily uh, the sources and the historiography, just the reference, but they are not concerned with doing that part of the economic, the, the academic craft, let's say, or job. They are very much concerned with the conceptualization of things. And I saw the Fritz book falls into this last category. And I think in, in doing that, you, you very much excelled because, again, this is very much enjoyable as a as a, as a reading, it is very much digestible and explains a lot to people who might not be experts in, in several of the many um, aspects and fields and countries that you touch there. So this is my first, um, let's say, compliment to the book. Um, so, of course, when, when these kind of book, um, books are written, some of the arguments feeding into the bigger picture, into the framework, are not new. So, for, so of course, the inability of the socialist regimes to, to deliver what they existed to deliver, not just what they promised, but I'll get to that later. Um, especially after the oil strike of the 70s, um, they are losing legitimacy because of this inability and their people bringing them down is not new. My favorite um, definition of, of this problem is actually dates back to a 1999 book published by Cambridge University Press uh, by Valerie uh, Valerie Bunce, um, who basically said that these regimes came to the unpalatable options, to unpalatable <laughs> options, liberalize and thereby destroy the system or put off reforms and then purchase short-term stability, but long-term doom. And this is exactly what you, uh, the part of the book that en engages with those regimes uh, remind us of. Um, we also know about this, the Soviet empire had become a liability already in the 70s, no longer an asset. So I think the innovation of your book, the things that I really enjoyed and I think are important is, first of all, the comparative element, which you very much um, presented at the beginning of your talk today of the analysis. And this is not only a, in, an enrichment per se, 
to, to do a comparative analysis. But I think it allows very much, and you, you brilliantly do so, to show to what extent the shock of energy and finance becoming dominant forces impacted on both systems of the Cold War, not just the poor communist losers ones, because the narrative that we grew up with was, yeah, this is the West globalization wiping out, uh, you know, the communist countries. It's not. It's a suffer. It's a suffering process <laughs> um, um, in the West too, and you you very much bring that to the fore. But I think more importantly and um, potent in 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 your book is the significance that um, this specific occurrence. Um, this juncture that was born outside the West, so the, the oil prices shock, had not just in enabling the West uh, to, to launch the ultimate challenge to, to the Soviet Union, not just to communism, but actually prompting that change in the West. So this, I found, was the true innovation. This is what I learned, let's say, in, in your book. It's not the genius of Reagan, a Reagan, sorry, administration bringing this about because, you know, he dreamt of it or his entourage dreamt of it. They were forced into, um, you know, coming up with a new strategy to cope with the challenges that were hitting the West and the US very much. So I think this, this is really big. And so I'm the second, so this this your book goes into and you very, very nicely put it also in the presentation. This is a triumph of the West narrative. And you're not endorsing that triumph or the, the, you know, the features of that triumph, but let's bring it back and you know not be ashamed because we are Westerners to say that was the case. But um, this qualification of how it came about is, is really uh, innovative. The second big innovation and contribution, which you also show in the, in the, in the division of the book and to part, is why neoliberalism became dominant. The system. There could have been a third way. That was the dream at the end of the Cold War. I, I was a teenager. I remember that, as particularly in Europe. That was very vivid. We can find a third way, the perfect third way, because the capitalism that we have is not good, and clearly communism cannot stand. So that would never happen. So I think that in short, your book is very convincing, thought-provoking, and revealing in, in the um, and the evidence that you bring about uh, to the fore in showing how across the two blocks, the new ideological justification for you know, the new economic course and policy became shared in the ruling elites. Again, this is not the West globalization wiping out. And a little bit in, in reaction to Aaron, if I may, um, some, some, um, there is a change, a uh, generational change in some of these socialist countries. And so some, some in the elites were already thinking this, sh this ship is sinking and we're already nourishing their own personal relation with capitalist <laughs> enterprises and finance to enrich themselves. And um, so completely not devoted to the cause of communism. Some were deeply believers still in, in the eighties for sure. Some others were just, Reformers, they didn't, they, they, you know, it's, yeah, it's sad that this isn't working, but this isn't working. So we have to move forward and not in a governmentative way, but really in a general reformist way. And Hungary, I think Fritz would, would, would agree is, is at the forefront of that. So my perplexity is a little bit plugging back into Arons. Um, I think the comparison and, and the broken promises thing, making promises and breaking them works to a certain point. So if we look at the essence of the two systems, liberal democracy's welfare state is a phase. It's not the essence of the liberal democracies or the capitalist democracies, while socialism is only about that promise. If we cannot deliver on that promise, it doesn't exist. It doesn't have the opportunity to exist in a different way. That, that was the drama of Gorbachev's reform. Uh, it, it was untenable in, in the very essence of it. So I think socialism was doomed to succeed or die, while 
capitalist democracies have different varieties of capitalism that they can implement. So in the end, what you say, they were more able to cope. Um, it, it, yes, but the others were had no options to cope. So I, there I'm a little bit perplexed, but this is the matter for, for the debate. Um, I think the most, um, mo more than saying just uh, this is how communists uh, fell, I think there is a sentence in the introduction that it you didn't bring to the extent that I, I think it would have mattered in the conclusion. And this, this is the failure of communism as a system of governance. This is very much the failure of the Soviet Union to provide a system of governance to its bloc and to, to keep it and to maintain it. And I think, again, the evidence that the US, and I very much enjoyed that part and that conclusion, that the US was able to make it it's a life pay for its renewed power and its renewed leadership out of a crisis, make the most out of it and actually come back with revenge. And the Soviet Union was not. So it's not just the essence, it's really, I think that the, the main component of, of your argument is the failure of communism, not per se in specific countries, but as a system of governance in, in the bloc in that you know, community, let's say. Um, so this brings me to my first question. And is it the West that, that gains? Because to me, it's really much the US there. This is a US narrative because you showed that there was a juncture there. Um, so again, let's qualify uh, Reagan policies, but in the end, it's the Volcker shock. It's not something agreed as a system in the G7. It's the Volcker shock hitting badly on it, the US allies. And you mentioned this, and I'm very grateful. The Europeans were very much, you know, eager to continue to lend <laughs> money to, to the social. So the European detente is a system of interdependence for both sides. So I, th I think, I don't like it. I don't endorse it. But I think that you bring more to the fore, the fact that this is a US driven triumph. This is also, I think I would push your conclusion even further. This is also could explain the unipolar moment. It's not the West, it's the US that lead the post-Cold War um, uh, order. So, I, you know, I'm very curious to, to, to see uh, whether this is pushing too far or not. Um, the second um, tiny question is, I think you need to explain the selection of the cases in the West, even just methodologically, because it's, it's unacceptable, and I say this with a lot of affection, to put that sentence in an academic book. I think I had the impression every now and then that you had specific audiences in mind. Um, in your book, and this also happened there because those the selection of cases in the West may be obvious, obvious for some audiences, but not for everyone. And the selection of for the East may be obvious, but you explained it. So I think this book will be uh, thought provoking in so many different conversations, and so you need to explain to anyone, <laughs> not necessarily, you know, seeing, seeing the selection of cases, even just methodologically. And then the final question provocation, I hope, is I like, I like the narrative very much about making promises and the broken promises. But it's very much a specific promise. So wouldn't you say that the phenomenal power of this Ugly, ugly, disgusting, I don't subscribe to it, the neoliberal ideology is that it made new promises, that it convinced the elect <laughs> in, in, in democracies where you have the options to, to believe what you want and to choose and to ditch others. I want to be rich. I want, I personally, as an individual, want to be rich. I don't care anymore about solidarity. This is bringing me down. I think this is the shaping of new promises that, again, was not an option for communism because that's the only single promise. 
Thank you very much, Angela. Fritz, your thoughts? Thank you, Angela, uh, for these these wonderful thoughts and questions. Um, I, you know, again, I, I agree. I, I wrote down here your third way comment. Um, I, one of the things I hoped to uh, set up in this book or comes out of this book is is that the just how uneven the scales were at this new kind of Stunde Null. So put like the end of the Cold War is not a blank slate upon which we can we we could build a new economic and social order. Or it, maybe it could have been if the United States had kind of forgiven all of the debts that were uh, in the Eastern Bloc, right? But this is a profoundly unequal moment where certain visions for what the future should hold have just enormously more material leverage behind them. Um, and and so I think that's that goes a long way uh, to explaining why some other version, uh, uh, some other third way does not really emerge because the people who have this uh, this material power are are in a position to now uh, wield it to particular ends. Um, you know, is I, I think these are great questions. That what is the welfare state of kind of the face of democratic capitalism, or and are there varieties of capitalism versus is socialism the essence? I mean, I you know, hopefully that's what the book provokes us to ask about what is essential about uh, these two systems and what is what can be interchanged or, or, or um, what is foundational and what is not. I agree with you ultimately, of course, that without, and I write at the end, uh, that communism made no sense in an era of breaking promises because the party could claim no special right to rule if it was just going to be an arbiter, an empty kind of an empty vessel for allocating the market's uh, rewards. Uh, and discipline, and so I think that's that's absolutely true. And and uh, hopefully by comparing these two systems, we can get a better sense of of what really is foundational to them as they move through the Cold War and and now beyond it. Um, you're right. The system of governance, communi communism as a system of governance. I mean, yes, it's um, probably over over promises in the first in the early in the in the book, but I think. What I what I hope the book delivers or, or exposes is the moments at which are the challenges that that expose why and when communism can no longer be that system of governance, and that's when these moments of discipline emerge. And so uh, it doesn't it's not a full analysis of how that system of governance breaks down, of course, but but I do think it's uh, because of course one of the narratives or, or arguments I'm pushing back against is is this idea that stagnation was was the the overriding challenge for the eastern bloc and and the reason i find that historically problematic is not that it wasn't true but that implies that all moments in in the stagnant history are relatively the same uh and so 1980 there's of course the argument out there that the cold war without gorbachev could have kept going on for many many decades um if you introduce notions of economic discipline and and uh, and the politics of breaking promises, then years like 1989, financially and economically start to look very, very different. And it becomes clear why things might have happened in 1989 um, and not in 1985 or 1995. And so I think the book hopefully offers a, a sense of why that system of governance broke down at the particular moment uh, that it did. Um, to your questions, I, yes, I think the United States is the ultimate Victor, although this is right, this is where the um, kind of even the idea of nation states starts to break down because who's exactly winning, of course, within the United States, and who's winning within the Western European formation, right, or or the the broader West. So, to me, the vo the story of the Volcker shock and Reaganomics is that American capitalists, the American state, and American consumers all win, and producers abroad in, in Japan and West Europe and Western Europe and, and other places, uh, relatively speaking, win versus American producers. Uh, and this is all negotiated. This is, you're right, it's of course not negotiated at the G7. It's done through uh, many, many market choices over time based in exchange rates and interest rates. But ultimately the West through the hands or through the decisions of, of Paul Volcker and Ronald Reagan, 
chooses a particular set of actors within the United States and abroad and privileges those. And most of those are the, you know, to simplify it, the capitalists within those respective societies. And so they're the ones, uh, I think, in terms of political economy, who ultimately prevail in this entire story, of course. Uh, there are many, many Americans who lose from this story, even as their country regains enormous power in the international system. And, and I think that the origins of our current moment, where the country remains enormously powerful in the world, but many of its own citizens kind of reject or don't understand what that power does for them in any significant way, kind of goes back to this, this moment where Volcker separated the fate of the country at large and many citizens uh, within it. Um, I'm sorry, I've lo uh, lost your... So which cases did I choose? Yes, the, the important methodological question. Um, you know, I, I guess my first, I wish the book could have been two or three chapters longer to include more Western European cases or to, to really account for the varieties of capitalism, basically. Uh, which I don't really do. If you're going to subsume all of Western economics under one umbrella and Eastern economics under another, you're already doing damage to the idea that there were varieties of capitalism. And so um, I don't, uh, the book doesn't offer a full explanation for how West Germany, for instance, or how Fr even France really, uh, or Italy, um, kind of address these challenges. I, I would, I think it's a great area for future research that if if this uh, book proves useful, hopefully others or perhaps I can, um, you know, try to figure out. I think the politics of breaking promises is um, in a sense separate from neoliberalism per se. I think it, it exists in ideological formations that are not purely neoliberal. And so uh, how social Democrats, for instance, uh, kind of manage the challenges associated with uh, breaking promises, so to speak. How do you restore price stability? How do you manage your country's integration with the global economy in ways that are going to lead to some forms of uh, deindustrialization or things like that? I think the, how they responded to those questions uh, is, a, is another area for this book that, uh, that I couldn't fully get into. I mean, the reason, of course, to choose Thatcher and uh, Reagan, or the United States and Britain in particular, um, first because in the British and the Polish case, there in fact were two unions here that were trying to, uh, as Arthur Scargill says, use extra par uh, parliamentary means to thwart their government, right? Uh, and they take on extremely different valence in their own societies. So solidarity becomes kind of freedom fighters by another name, uh, according to the, you know, from the Reagan administration, even as Reagan and Thatcher are uh, fighting against labor within their own societies. And so uh, I think some of that would certainly within the labor movement would have been picked up on, but the kind of dissonance within uh, Reagan's mind or, or Thatcher's mind about who they were supporting on the other side of the Iron Curtain and who they were uh, fighting against within their country was uh, was lost on them. It seems in some in some cases. Um, the the other reason, of course, to think about Thatcher and and more Thatcher than Reagan, is as I try to bring out in the book, many officials in the East end up looking at her uh, experiment, look at looking at Thatcherism and saying that she's accomplished something that they themselves. Uh, want to accomplish in a, in a certain kind of way. So they want to achieve the kind of return to growth uh, in their own societies. And Thatcherism, for, for better or worse, certainly, you know, in retrospect, it seems clear to me for worse. But at the time, it was viewed as uh, a system that uh, was kind of relaunching industrial economies. And so, um, I think that that's the reason to include, uh, you know, if you have Soviet officials who are saying um, Thatcher is doing a perestroika in in uh, their societies, then that seems worth bringing about or talking about. Uh, finally, yes, I, the new promises of neoliberalism, absolutely. Um, 
they it was a new promise um and uh, you know i i end the book with the, the margaret thatcher's uh advisor john hoskins who says uh internally at this point but if we can get over the traditional british hang up that a few people making a lot of money is a bad thing the kind of the future will be will be wonderful um and that it seems seems to me is is was of course one of the neoliberal promises that the trickle down effect would would uh would work its magic and um that hasn't come true in in the least and so but but it was a new set of promises that it, that were offered to people uh at the time and so um it, even as promises were broken the ability to kind of offer a new set of promises was key to to how all of that worked absolutely Thank you. I'm now opening this up to many questions that are in the Q&A that people have entered. Uh, no hands are currently up, so I'm going straight to what you've written. Uh, and Nelson Lichtenstein, uh, writing in from the West Coast, uh, poses a question about a book that we featured last season uh, in the spring, uh, Gary Gerstle's The Rise and Fall of the New Deal Order. And Nelson writes, Gary Gerstle argues that the end of the Cold War opened the door to the triumph of neoliberalism, especially in the U.S., because there was no longer any system that seemed a non-capitalist challenge to the Western economic system. But your argument would seem to be the opposite. Neoliberalism ended the Cold War, mainly in the East, but to a degree in the world of Thatcher and Reagan. Your views of the Gerstle thesis. Yes. Um... I don't. I mean, I don't know that we're necessarily in in contradiction, maybe, or um, and I, I hope at some point to be able to talk to Gary about uh, how our books intersect. But I think if he's right that um, the end of the collapse of the Soviet Union or the end of the Cold War was a moment where the neoliberal, uh, the spread of neoliberalism, could accelerate in the extreme. I hope what my book brings out is that. Um, the challenges, of course, that are faced by Western societies and Eastern societies are not different ones. Um, so in, in, as far as I understand, and re from my reading of the book, um, the Soviet, the collapse of the Soviet Union kind of appears uh, as an important exogenous factor in, uh, in the late 1980s. My book, of course, is trying to show that uh, the, the mutual challenges that come out of the economic crisis of the 1970s produce both neoliberalism in the West and the collapse of the Soviet Union or the Eastern Bloc in the East. So um, to me, there's a set of economic challenges that precede both neoliberalism and uh, and the collapse of the, of the Eastern Bloc. And it's those economic challenges that ultimately kind of lead to both of these fundamental developments that I think uh, Gary puts in kind of sequence where neoliberalism emerges first and then uh, the collapse emerges later, I see them as kind of running in parallel to each other and ultimately explained by a similar point of, uh, of origin. Thank you. Stephen Shore poses this question. Would you say that the fall of communism was a crisis of faith in that no one in Eastern Europe believed in the system any longer? And that even within their respective security services, no one thought that the system was worth defending any longer? Also, beginning perhaps with the recession of 2008 and 2009 is not a similar crisis of faith developing in the West, with fewer voters on the right and left believing that the free enterprise system truly works for their benefit. Um, thank you for the, for the questions. These are very interesting. I, I don't think, I think it's too strong to say that no one believed the um, uh, believed in saving the system any longer. I think uh, we were talking a little bit about it earlier, um, but, uh, you know, for instance, the, the chief of the Soviet general staff uh, kills himself after the uh, failed coup of August 1991 because he has, in his view, um, overseen the collapse of this state that he was sworn to defend and, and spent his life uh, you know, trying to uphold. So I think there is there's vast disappointment among many people that the vision of a socialist future is no longer uh, no longer appears to be viable. Um, 
So I, I think there were people who were very interested in seeing the system uh, continue to exist. That's not, uh, I think that can exist, that, that hopefully that, that uh, we can say that alongside many, many people who believe that in order for it to continue to exist, it would have to kind of radically recreate its, its foundations of socio and economic governance. And so um, even embodied in a person like Mikhail Gorbachev, uh, he's a socialist through and through, and yet he is uh, trying to kind of remake the foundations of his country from the bottom up. And, so, and, and often uh, in a way that moves his country towards a more uh, market socialist and eventually uh, just kind of social democratic system. Um, and so I think that there's kind of these this tension between uh, the hope that socialism, state socialism can continue to exist uh, right alongside this recognition that um, if it is to, to exist, then uh, it needs a radical remaking. And in that way, to go to your second question, I think we are in a similar point where um, there's widespread belief across the political spectrum, it seems to me, that uh, if our uh, system is to continue to uh, exist, then it will need a kind of radical uh, makeover. And there's just no consensus about exactly uh, what that would be. And so I think there would be uh, defenders of the system, just as there were in in uh, the Soviet Union in the, in the late 1980s. Um, but we do no doubt find ourselves in a moment where uh, if, if we are to continue, we'll have to, uh, to rethink some of the foundational aspects of of democratic capitalism as it currently, or neoliberal uh, democracy as it currently exists. I want to get in a question of my own, if I may, uh, co-chair prerogative, and it has to do with who knew what and when did they know it. And you write about both blocks um, and the ways in which political leaders possessed or did not possess certain knowledge about the economies that they were dealing with. Uh, in the case of uh, the communist bloc, uh, in some instances, you know, it was ideological blinders. In other cases, a small number of economists, you know, have the information. In other cases, they suppress the information or they misread it. On the Western side, or in the case of the United States, you know, Reagan comes in with a series of programs uh, that do not unfold as expected. Um, and they are happily surprised when the inflow of capital somehow seems to solve the problem um, that, uh, that they are confronting. But they too, looking at the Eastern Bloc, don't exactly understand, um, as perhaps often as you might think, what was going on. So if you could talk about for both the West and the East, uh, the what did they know well, when did they know it and why didn't they know more about what was taking place? Absolutely. Yes. Um, I, you know, I, it, it's part of being a historian, I think, to, to know that uh, and to, to realize that historical actors are constantly confronted by the limits of their own knowledge and kind of unexpected consequences that flow from, uh, from their policies. And I think uh, you're right that in, in both particular, let's start in the West, um, one of the things that I wanted to, to draw out was that just because the neoliberals uh, we, or Paul Volcker and Ronald Reagan end up in power does not mean that their program automatically would succeed. And particularly because it doesn't succeed on the terms that they had set out, then we need an explanation. We need to understand why it succeeded in some sort of different way, because it could have easily failed or it should have failed according to the, the kind of expectations that people had in the late 1970s. And so trying to understand why it didn't fail uh, was an important aspect of, of the book. Um, as far as what they knew about what was going on in the East, I think everyone knew that there were significant weaknesses, economic weaknesses in the East. The part that they didn't know and couldn't imagine was that the Soviet Union was than was itself uh, slowly giving up the reins of power within the Eastern Bloc and would in 1989 kind of let them fully go. And so I think the thing that kept, for instance, sovereign debt from being a fully weaponized kind of uh, tool of the Cold War is that just as often leaders in the Reagan administration, for instance, thought that 
if you immiserated a, a, a country in the Eastern Bloc or threatened to do that, they would just turn to, back to Moscow and would kind of remain under Moscow's umbrella. And so often they tried to, in, with economic inducements, to pull them away from Moscow's orbit. Uh, if they had known the full weakness of, of Moscow's position within the bloc and Moscow's own kind of uh, rethinking of, of its uh, national interest, then I think they would have acted probably much more aggressively than they already did uh, to try to exploit that, that weakness. Um, Within the Eastern Bloc, you know, yes, economic knowledge was was famously um, secretly kept to at the highest highest levels of the government. Um, I detail how, in the East German case, even the people who have the the supposed keys to the state secrets of the state finances don't actually know uh, that their their situation isn't as bad as uh, they believed it was. Um, I don't think there's a overarching explanation for that besides the fact that bureaucracies, uh, particularly communist ones where incentives to share information are just very, very poor, uh, particularly accurate information if it's if it's not good information uh, or not good news, um, that often, you know, that, that type of information was not widely shared and therefore uh, it wasn't easy to act upon it. And so I think uh, across the communist bloc, similarly, uh, had there been, uh, easier access to accurate but uh, unpleasant information that would have uh, been a good thing overall for their survival but but based on how the system itself was set up uh, it was just not something they were they were prone to do so um, ultimately in terms of the Cold War I think I think this is what makes I, I conclude in the in the uh, in the conclusion that this is not an, a recommendation for financial coercion in any sense because the thing that stands in the way of of understanding what kind of debt will will do as leverage is not knowing what the other side is is fully thinking, and so um, it's these information asymmetries or these information imperfections that I think ultimately stand in the way of this book uh, serving as any kind of recommendation that uh, financial information can be used as a as a lever of state power in any kind of consistent way. Thank you. Claiborne Carson asks a straightforward question about the role of rising uh, military costs or the rising cost of military spending, the role that that played in the fall of the Soviet Union. You have other factors uh, in your account. So how would you weigh uh, the military expenditure portion of that um, as you kind of survey causation? I think it's I think it's very important. Um, you know, we've often looked, uh, there's there's been well-known evidence for quite a while that Gorbachev was quite concerned about the uh, level of Soviet military spending and how it would stand in the way of his broader reform plans within the Soviet Union. Um, and so I think uh, ultimately the ability of the United States to spend much more money on the military, on its military, without in any kind of direct way um, uh, taking away from its domestic resources. Uh, that's certain Reagan did that as well, but there was no financial need reason that he had to do that. The, so these kind of vastly different pools of resources that the United States and the Soviet Union can draw on to build up their military industrial complexes, I think ultimately does prove to be a, a, a very important uh, uh, causal factor in the end of the Cold War. The question then of course becomes how do you get from that disparity in military spending to a peaceful end of the Cold War? And those are uh, two very different uh, questions to which the rest of the book is, is devoted. Thank you. So here's a question that's gonna take you a little bit uh, chronologically beyond uh, the period that you, you delve into here. Michael Goodman asks, how do you explain the ability of Cuba to remain firmly aligned with the socialist system after the collapse of communism in the East? Well, Michael, it's, um, it's a, question, a question I've often asked and I don't have a good answer for. Um, I, except to say that I think, unfortunately, uh, Fidel Castro and the Cuban government ended up very good at uh, imposing the politics of breaking promises uh, on its own people. So Cuba, from 
uh, I'm not an expert on it, but went through a very similar kind of uh, boom and bust cycle in its uh, sovereign debt and access to foreign capital. Of course, it was heavily reliant on the Soviet Union uh, itself and and uh, and resources that came from the Soviet Union. Um, but uh, in both the Cuban case and the North Korean case, uh, the the willingness and the ability of the government to kind of turn the screws and uh, really put their people through significant economic hardship uh, after the end of the Cold War was uh, the key determining factor, it seems to me, in their ability as regimes to um, continue to exist long after the social block, socialist block itself had, had collapsed. May yeah. I interject on this? Absolutely. Uh, just, yeah, so as we, as we were a bit, but Fritz, I think um, this doesn't, doesn't contradict your argument on the book. Mm -hmm. Um, because the peculiarity of the Cuban um, socialist experience is that the revolution is very much continuing, let's say, throughout. So it doesn't have the connotation of the Stalinist fixed thing. And the population was very much more behind the effort. So I think the legitimacy aspect of your argument is what explains the fact Cuba, not North Korea, uh, that the population was was agreeing to bear the costs of those broken promises and stagnation and so on, while in Central and Eastern Europe the population was very demanding and uh, you know suffering from the party as an imposition, blah blah blah. So the legitimacy conundrum there is is different and so goes with the flow. And also I think the book I, I very much like in the book that you. Very, we're very precise. This is about the global north, and this is about mm. the end of the Cold War. So this is not about variety of socialism. So Cuba, North Korea, and China are not there to be explained by the book, because the book is about that Cold War, the end of that specific experience, and not, in general, communism on Earth. Um, so great question, but it doesn't contradict, I think, what you argue. Well, and you know, it is those are in some ways uh, an author's attempt to try to put some limits on uh, some ideas that hopefully people will run with and figure out where they work and where they don't. Uh, it was just you know in this book, I do think there are reasons that the global north is a kind of separate case, um, but that doesn't mean that these dynamics aren't at work in other places. And I hope uh, not just me, but it would be a great pleasure to have other people trying to uh, figure out why they work in other places or why they didn't and, and, and the limits of it as well. Thank you. I am watching the clock closely and unfortunately I need to bring this to a close. I think we could go on for, for much longer. We only touched upon a fraction of the, of the issues in this very rich and very important book. So I want to express my thanks uh, to Fritz, to Angela, to Aaron. Uh, and I would ask uh, you to all join us uh, next week uh, for not just one, but two Washington History Seminar webinars. Uh, on Monday, the 26th of September at 4 p.m., we featured Jonathan Haslam's new book, the Specter of War, International Communism, and the Origins of World War II, with commentators Julian First and Mary Barton. And days later, on Thursday the 29th at 4 p.m., we're back with a session on Nicole Hemmer's new book, Partisans, the Conservative Revolutionaries Who Remade American Politics in the 1990s, with discussants Don Wolfensberger and Heather Hendershot. So there's a lot of history to talk about uh, in the weeks ahead. Thank you, everyone. We hope to see you all next week. Till then, take care, be safe, and good night.